just uh, remind yourselves of the verse again, Colossians 1 and, and verse 15, and it's page 1026, 1026. Colossians 1 and 15. He uh, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I think you've begun to see, uh, too, the great relief that that is. The whole, I suppose it's the whole truth of uh, seeing more, you know, than, than just that, you know, or, or I think 1970 was when we started Campus Church, you know, or, or, or then, I mean, it has to go back further than that, but uh, 6 AD, you know, and, and on back. It's the whole truth of seeing more than just this 1998 and then the year 2000 <coughs> and then whatever the last year will be when the last one of us totters down the driveway, you know, with the last cassette to send to some, <laughs> to some that's Sheila, or maybe, who knows, maybe it's somebody else. But uh, it's such a, a relief to to really get up there, because that's where that verse is looking from, you know, that Christ himself is the firstborn of all creation, and in him all things were created. And at that very moment, when all things were created, what we're seeing is that God, from that point, could see all of it. And I think we knew that in our heads, probably, but it is startling to begin to see what that means. That God, at that moment, saw every life, every life that has ever been and will ever be. And of course, he saw our tiny little lives, you know, that go from wherever I, I, of course, I think of myself as 34, but some of you are 45 or 55 or whatever it is. But the little life that we have, that he saw that. And he saw the life of our grandfather before that. And he saw the great grandfathers and the great right back to Adam, you know. He saw everything. And not only Adam, you know, but he saw before the world was. And so God saw everything in one second. And at that same moment, it's so good to escape from this little sequential idea, you know, that, oh, God, first of all, had Jesus, and then he thought, hmm, what will I do with this wonderful son I have? Oh, well, I'll make it work. Well, it's so silly. Obviously, he saw everything in a second. He saw everything in a millisecond. So he saw Christ then coming to earth and bringing and creating the earth and then dealing with the earth at each point and eventually bringing the earth to completion. <clears throat> and eventually making a new heaven and a new earth. And that means that he saw Christ in this little guy who was born 34, or this little girl who was born 45, or this little girl who was born 55. He saw Christ living in that person and achieving the little bit that he was able to do with that person, that little bit, the little, uh, the little articles that that person was able to write the little bit of work in the cafe that that person was able to do. Christ did all that in each one. And so Christ actually lived all those lives in a millisecond. And that's why uh, that psalm says, you know, that every day of our lives was written in God's book before there were any of them. Because obviously, the infinite God could see it all in a second. And he sent his son Christ in each one of these lives 
If you say, in Hitler, yes, yes, in Hitler, Christ was trying, was straining to get out through that man and to take over and to express his love. Christ was trying in each life, each life that was ever lived, Christ was in that life, and Christ has lived it. That's the glory of it. Christ has already lived your life. It's not a surprise. Just think of it for a moment. It cannot be otherwise. You cannot have the God of the whole universe wondering, what is this little creature that I have made going to do? You can't have that. He has to know what that little creature is going to do, and yet he has to be working at all according to the counsel of his will in such a way that that little creature is actually able to exercise his free will but that God saw all that in a moment, that Christ saw all that. Of course, it's a great relief to us because it gets away from the whole idea, you know, that Christ is up here and we have to somehow get up to him. And that God has put us away down here and there's the sky in between and there are all kinds of things in between and we have to try to forge our way up through these things to Christ. No, we are in Christ. We were each one created in Christ Jesus and we are part of his very body. And all that has been done. And indeed, did Christ live through our sin and our rebellion? Yes, yes. And God saw that. And God saw the effect that that would have on our bodies and our personalities. And God foresaw all that. And even when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even in the midst of that, Christ died and renewed all that. So it's all been done. So all that has been accomplished. And I don't know about you, but it's brought a, a great rest and relief, certainly, to my heart and mind that this is not some salvation that we've to achieve. This has been some salvation that God has already achieved. Everything has already been done. It, Indeed, you remember it does say in the Bible that God came to the sixth day and then on the seventh day he rested. And other pieces of the Bible imply that we are now living in the time of God's rest and that God himself is living in his Sabbath. The work has been accomplished and now he is resting and he is at peace and he has reconciled the world to himself he has done everything to bring this all into order, and the outworking that is taking place at this moment is exactly what he has permitted. And the things that seem to be still going wrong, those are the things that he has allowed to go wrong because he is going to use that to bring men's minds to himself and to accomplish all that he has planned. So in God's eyes, there are no stray lines or stray strings or threads that have not been woven into the pattern. In God's mind, it has all. It is like that Indian rug, you know, and the, the, a little wrong thread comes in and the guy does not take it all off the loom. He weaves the wrong thread into the pattern, you know, so that the whole thing goes right. And it's like that. God has woven the whole thing into a pattern and it has all been done. Now, that is the kind of thing that we have just been reading there in Ephesians. That's the whole heart of these early verses in Ephesians, you know, and you know them, of course, uh, well. Uh, that verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It, all it means is that God has already seen everything and, he has, and Christ has already lived that for us and redeemed our lives and everything is already in Christ for us and it's all available to us. There's nothing that is not available to us at this moment. 
And if there's any tendency, you know, for us to say, oh, well, you know, what Paul's saying is he's talking to the Ephesians locally and he's saying, you know, you have become Christians. You, God has blessed you in Christ, you know. It's just a temporal thing. No, it's not at all. Look at verse 4. Even, lest you tie it down to just, you know, a few years, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So it's made very plain there that the meaning of God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is that God had done that before we ever appeared on the earth. Just the same way as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And I think that'll, that certainly, I'm sure, helps any of us here who wonder, well, are we really Christian, you know, or are we really saved? I mean, it just is plain and obvious. God chose us in Christ from before the foundation of the world. Of course, there's no, there's no doubt of it. Of course, we are in Jesus. And then in verse 5, it's so plain. He destined us in love to be his sons. Lest we think, oh, well, it's just we were his creatures, you know. We were made creatures in Christ. No, he destined us as in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. And then in verse 7, in him we have redemption. According to the riches, you remember, of his grace, which he lavished upon us. It's already been done. So the whole emphasis of these early verses is that all this has been accomplished, that we've been created in Jesus, we were made part of him, that God foresaw that we would reject that, and Christ determined that he would bear that rejection, and he would bear <coughs> the sin, he would bear our sins in his own body, and he would hold on to us. And then when he was raised up, we were raised up, and the Bible is very clear on that, that Christ <coughs> ra ro rose from the dead, and we were raised with him. God, out of the great mercy with which he has loved us, even when we were yet sinners, made us alive together with Christ, when before the foundation of the world. And we're silly, you know, if we keep holding on to the little temporal and time thing and say, oh, well, now, wait a minute, how could he raise us up before we were born? Well, because God saw it all in a millisecond. We'll see when we get to heaven that the whole time thing is an image, is a mirage, that there's no such thing as a time, that everything is one eternal. We kind of know it at, at the moment. I mean, I don't know if you... Do you feel any different from what you did when you were 18? I can't tell you. I don't. I don't feel any different from what I was when I was 18. I mean, the mind is not able to perceive any time difference because actually it's all a mirage. Really, if the hair wasn't gray and the wrinkles didn't come, you wouldn't know. And that's why heaven will be so wonderful, because there'll be none of that. And you'll realize that it is all one eternal moment. And so what we can see plainly from here is that that has already been done. God foresaw what we would do. He planned, therefore, that Christ would bear that. And he himself was willing to bear it and to bear the pain of it and to hold on to us. And then to raise us up in Jesus and make us new. And that is what has happened. If you say, you know, well, why, well, how do you explain the present situation? It's obvious, so that we would all see plainly, so that it would be an obvious choice. It would be the tree of life or the tree of, the tree of good and evil. It would be an obvious choice. Here's what life would be like if you weren't in my son. And every time we see some terrible thing happen in this world, every time we see ourselves do something wrong, we see what life would be like outside of Jesus. And so that's the purpose of allowing this to take place. But it's not that God has not already dealt with all of that. Now, it's quite interesting uh, how that is brought together in this verse that we're studying at the moment. <coughs> Maybe you'd look at it in... in Ephesians 1 and then in verse four, 13. In him you also, who have heard the word of truth, that is, you who have heard this explanation, 
You have heard that God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, having destined us in love to be a son through Jesus Christ. You who have heard this explanation of reality, that you were created in Jesus, and that you were raised up in Jesus, and made new in Jesus, and that all that has already happened, you who have heard this word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news, that you've been delivered from yourselves, and you've been delivered from what you would otherwise be, and you've believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. See, there's no question of whether all that was done to us. There's no question of whether we were created in Christ. There's no question of whether we were put to death in Christ. There's no question of whether we were raised in Christ. There's no question about whether Christ has already lived our lives for us and has smoothed every path and made all the crooked things straight. There's no question of that. That's a fact. Faith can't change that fact. Faith can't make that fact real. But when you have belief in that, and when you have faith that that is the situation, and that you are in Jesus and Jesus is in you, then there comes down into you a sweet spirit of peace and rest and joy. And God sends the Spirit of his Son into your heart and you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. It's it's quite important, see, to see that, that that's what the sealing of the Holy Spirit is. It's not sealing whether this thing has been done or not. That has been done whether or not you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That has been done. You have been created in Christ. You have been crucified in Christ. You've been raised up in Jesus. He has lived your life for you. He has it all planned moment by moment. That all is fact. But having heard that explanation of reality, and having heard the good news of the deliverance that that brings you from your own little self, and having believed that, and put your trust in Christ himself, then there comes into you a sweet spirit that is in accordance with that reality, that expresses that reality in you. And in fact, God sends the spirit of his own Son into you so that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We'll talk next next day about when that occurs. But that's the relationship of the sealing of the Holy Spirit to the fact of your salvation. And I think what Satan tries to do at times is to confuse the two in our minds, you know. Well, wait a minute, am I sealed with the Holy Spirit? Well, then if I am, then those things must have taken place. And if I'm not sealed with the Holy Spirit, then those things must not have taken place. No, those things took place. This this is all reality. It's simply that when you hear of that explanation and you realize that that has delivered you from your own self-centered self and from your own little life, and you are actually part of this great Jesus, you are actually a little bit of the Son of God and you're delivered from all the smallness of being your own tiny little self. And when you do that, and you realize that my life is nothing but Jesus, I have then no life but Jesus. He he who shines the sunshine upon us, he who makes the flowers, he who makes the birds soar, he is my life. I have no life but him. He is my life. And that moment there comes into you a spirit of spaciousness, of magnanimity, a spirit of greatness, a spirit that lives above the world, the spirit of Jesus himself. 
and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jones says some good things, you know, that I thought are worth uh, mentioning. Uh, first, a seal is that which authenticates or conveys authority. Two men may draw up an agreement. It may be to sell a house or arrange a business or something else in that realm. They have agreed about the terms which have been written or printed. But as we know, that document is not really valid, and neither man is going to be content with it unless and until it is signed and sealed. You need the seal in addition even to a signature. It makes it more authentic. It makes it more absolute signed and sealed. Now, he doesn't say that uh, it means the thing has taken place, whereas before it's signed and sealed, it hasn't. It has taken place, actually. They have, they have made the deal. But it makes it authentic when it's signed and sealed. A seal, therefore, is that which conveys authority or establishes the authenticity, the validity, the truth of a document or statement. In other words, the Holy Spirit seals inside you that all these things are true. But they are true, whether they're signed and sealed inside you or not. But the sealing of the Holy Spirit is an authentication inside you that these are true. And that's why often people say, you know, the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. It kind of gives an assurance within us. But we do need to keep distinguishing between the assurance and the fact itself. And it really gets, it can get back in a strange way to, uh, I, I forget, of course, how many engines you remember, how many carriages, you know, the little train does, you know, but isn't it fact and faith and feeling, you know, and uh, that's the way to it. You know, I think it's something like that. Fact and faith and feeling. I mean. And, uh, of course, the uh, the, the, the f so often we, we make this the, the engine, you know, the, 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 uh, the feeling. And we say, oh, if the feeling isn't there, then, uh, of course, the faith comes off the rails, and then before we know it, the fact seems to have gone. And, of course, the right way around is where this is not the engine, but this is the engine, and this is what pulls everything. And the fact comes first, and then the faith, and then the feeling may come or it may not come. But, of course, the real danger is that we will get them confused and we will allow the one to affect the other, and it can't be. Uh, he says, another meaning which attaches to sealing is that it is a mark of ownership. This is often used in the case of animals. The owner of the man who buys the animal puts his mark or seal upon them to indicate that they belong to him. The same is done with property, or again in documents. It's to indicate that something, whatever it is, belongs to and is the property of the person who has used that particular seal. The seal has a particular image on it, which belongs to no one man only. And therefore, when you see that seal or image on anything, you know that it is a property or possession of one particular person. So I agree with you that the sealing of the Holy Spirit will often bring then the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and those will be the marks and witness of Christ within you. But again, it's very important to see. These are facts, whether those are in your life or not. These are facts. You may say, you mean that Christ has borne me and has borne the pain of my sin, whether I know it or not? Yes, yes. You mean he has borne this for me even if I curse him? Yes. So it's very important to keep the thing in the right perspective because this is the basis of our salvation. This is what everything hangs on. This is, the, this is the most vital thing to retain, that this is fact, whatever you have done with it. Furthermore, a seal is also used for the purpose of security. If you desire a parcel to, parcel to go carefully by post or by train, you not only tie it up, but you melt sealing wax onto the knots and then stamp the wax with a seal. If that seal has in any way been broken or marred, it is an indication that someone has been tampering with the parcel. There's an instance of this in the New Testament. When our Lord was buried, the Roman authorities and the Jews were concerned as to what his followers might do with his body. So they rolled a stone over the mouth of the grave and then sealed it to make it secure. So he's saying, you know, the sealing with the Holy Spirit is, is a mark of the ownership of God on that life. And in a way, it seals it, you know. 
and secures it. And so there is that real sense that a person who is not sealed with the Holy Spirit finds themselves often in what we call the position of a carnal Christian, who the good that I would I do not, and the evil that I want to avoid is the very thing I do. And so there's great uncertainty and doubt in their lives. And the Holy Spirit, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, brings a sense of security, a sense that my life corresponds with reality. And of course, that's what it's really all about. Living moment by moment in the light of the fact that we have been created in Jesus, that we've been crucified in him, that we've been raised in him, and that we're secure in him. And from that flows a peace in your life in all kinds of situations. I think uh, my wife said something about some people who had suffered greatly during the war, perhaps in concentration camps, you know, that kind of thing. And then their comment uh, afterwards was, ever after that, none of us sweat the small stuff. None of us sweat the small stuff. In other words, nothing worries you, because you face death and you face the greatest misery you could ever imagine in life. So after that, nothing is difficult to bear. Well, really, it's the same thing, you know. Thus, we find that there are three meanings to this term, sealing, authenticity and authority, ownership and security, and safety. And then he just says at the end, you know, Westcott sums up very well the meaning of him that God the Father hath sealed by saying that it means solemnly set apart for the fulfillment of a charge and authenticated by intelligible sign, signs. The Father had authenticated the Son by intelligible signs. The miracles, the, work, the works, the words, everything about him, having been given the Spirit in all his fullness, he had been sealed and had been authenticated. And he says, we have seen then the meaning of the term as it is found in common usage and also in Scripture, and we find that they coincide. In the case of our Lord, we are told that a declaration was made saying, this is my beloved Son, and that that was confirmed by his words and works. And it's the same with us. The sealing of the Holy Spirit is a seal that we are God's. But it's very important to keep the thing the right way around. This is fact, whether, it's, whether they're sealing or not. This is fact, and it remains fact all the time. And the sealing is something that follows and should follow. But it's vital for us to keep our eyes on the fact and to say to ourselves, now what does this mean? You mean I'm part, I'm part of Jesus? And he has actually lived this whole life that I am destined to live here on earth. He has actually lived it already. He has not only lived it, but he has faced all the intractable inconsistencies that I am going to face tomorrow and the next years of my life. Jesus has faced all those, and he has passed them through his own hands and through his own death and has taken the sting out of them all so that I simply have a peaceful, open, untrammeled road to walk right straight home to heaven. Well, if that's the case, why sweat this small stuff? I mean, whoopee! There's nothing that we need fear. And that's what happens. We suddenly realize that and the joy of the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and we are sealed with him. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that we see it all true and plain, and that there is nothing for us to do but to walk joyfully the road that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, we thank you that that is the road that we have and that we can walk on this year and then the next few years 
until we walk into your eternal, ever-present presence. Lord, we thank you. We bow to you, Lord Jesus, our very life, the world within which we live. Thank you, Lord. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and evermore.